Outrocast. Hey, Trevor, can you hear me okay? Yep, yeah, hey, how's it going? Great, and yourself there? Eh, not too bad, not too bad. Thanks for asking. Do, do you, I call you Trev, Trevor, K-Trev? What do you like? Uh, most people go with K-Trev. Well, K-Trev it is. <laughs> uh, before I ask you the stuff that I really want to know, I have a question for my wife about Letterkenny that neither sure. of us can figure out. And that's, do you and Derry live at Wayne's house? No, we just hang out there. Okay, now I know. <laughs> so I really appreciate you doing this. And I had a kind of a, a changing moment about you when I saw that Braun Strowman responded to your Halloween costume. Was that, you know, you were just checking the phone at 2 a.m. and you saw that or did someone tip you off to it? Uh, I noticed that people kept uh, tagging his, uh, his actual thing. And uh, he, I first noticed he got back to me on Twitter. And then I noticed he'd commented on, uh, on the Instagram post. And uh, yeah, it was pretty funky. But uh, at this point, I've discovered that uh, Letterkenny is a known entity in the WWE locker room. So I, I wasn't entirely surprised that, uh, that I got a response from Braun, uh, considering, considering Alexa Bliss is a, such a big fan of the show. I'm pretty sure she's, she's whispered it in his ear to check it out. So that <laughs> by proxy that Ryan Cabrera has to be a fan of the show, whether or not he loves it. Yeah, probably. <laughs> now, has have there been rumblings that the AEW locker room is also into the show? Uh, I know I, I, I got a response to a tweet uh, I made a few months ago. I tweeted out that, uh, is it just me or does Orange Cassidy look an awful lot like the ginger, uh, allegedly? And then uh, uh, Orange Cassidy responded that I should take about 20% off there. So... <laughs> <laughs> so he's into it too there was a monologue actually what do you call that opening segment part that seems impossible to memorize and get the timing of the first segment of the show before the theme do you have a name for that segment oh the the cold open segment okay there was the great cold open that was just wrestler related name puns did they go to you to write that and check that up or is there a big wrestling following amongst the cast and crew uh, well, um, one of the other writers, Trevor Risk, is also a big wrestling fan, and we spend a lot of time uh, talking wrestling when he comes around the set. And that was uh, that was uh, definitely his creation. The, the, they'll bounce it past me to see if uh, there's anything I think that should change, but uh, I have to say Risky's wrestling knowledge is pretty much uh, right up there. So he uh i didn't we didn't have to futz around with that one too much it was re pretty much ready to go from the page yeah you guys and we just got to have fun with it you did get deep with some of your references it wasn't just say cena hulk hogan undertaker you know you got the hardys in there from what i recall you got miz in there so i got the vibe that whoever wrote that and i found out it's you and another dude named trevor seem like lifelong wrestling fans, not just the last five years? I, I, I would say it was way more risky than me. I was literally just on set and they're like, hey, what do you think about this? And I was like, oh, this is solid. Risky did all the writing for it. Uh, yeah, lifelong wrestling fans, uh, you know. Uh, he actually uh, showed me, um, he found this, this uh, preview for, uh, a failed wrestling experiment they tried in Calgary years ago. And it was all teenagers wrestling. It was like someone took electric circus and wrestling and mashed them together. It was like a teenage dance party with wrestling. And it was all like the young heart kids. It was, oh yeah, uh, it was Natty DJ, and DJ yeah. and uh, yeah. Davy Boy Smith Jr. And Jack Evans, a young Jack Evans, uh, were all on the roster. And, uh, I think Eric Bischoff and uh, Bret Hart were producers on it. And uh, it, it ended up not going anywhere because the legality of having young children wrestle. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you were to go down the list of all the failed TV based wrestling promotions and all the things that looked like they would have happened that didn't, I think that you could practically have a 24 seven wrestling channel like, uh, what's that Canadian sitcom? I'm not just asking because you're Canadian, but what's that Canadian sitcom from the late 80s that was just about wrestling that had random NWA, WCW people on it? 
Oh. Have you yeah, ever seen the one where I, I'm thinking that's the one where the the, the guy's a high school teacher by day yes. and secretly a wrestler by night. Yes. And uh, I think I think Steve Williams and the Italian Stallion were like body doubles on that. And they definitely used a lot of the NWA guys. I'm trying to remember. Uh, someone's going to have that one. I, I was actually looking that show up not that long ago. Uh, I can't think of the name of it for the life of me. I could pull out my phone and, and Google it in a second. Well, I know what it is you're talking about. And the fact that you just said the Italian stallion just shows how deep into this you are. But something I like to find out about people who are big wrestling fans is if they've always been out about it or it's just the past couple of years, it's been cool to tell people you're a wrestling fan and not shameful at all. Oh, no, I never stopped uh, wearing my wrestling T-shirts and uh, be, you know, I, I would just uh, uh, find the other guys who like wrestling too. Some of my friends would give up on it, but there'd always be the, the few of us that weren't letting go no matter what. Makes sense to me. I find that most of the celebrities, and I put you in that celebrity category based on how much Letter Kenny we've watched in this household, uh, most of the celebrities who like wrestling seem to be comedians. The majority of them are. And it's almost like the secret society in a way. Like the guy who connected us, uh, Daniel Shahori, secret wrestling fan. He's not super out about it, but he's partially out about it. But uh, I assume you know Tim Robinson, the comic who's on SNL and he had the show Detroiters. Yes, yes. And he, you know, like one character did a rock bottom to the other character on Detroiters. And you have to go, there's wrestling fans there. Do you find <laughs> that most of your friends that like wrestling are comics? Uh, they've at least dipped their toes into comedy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot, of my, a lot of my wrestling buddies are, are comedy buddies. We actually used to go to the indies uh, shows in Toronto and we'd roll like 20 comics deep. We'd take up two rows of, of just comedians and we'd, uh, we'd, we'd heckle all the heels and cheer all the faces and uh, they'd launch themselves at us, which we found out is how the wrestlers shut up loud fans, just throw someone at them. <laughs> what are the good promotions or indie promotions in Ontario or Toronto? Oh, there's so many. Like, every time I turn around, there seems to be a new one popping up. Uh, I've, I've uh, gone to see uh, the Super Kick shows oh, yeah. uh, in Toronto, which uh, uh, Ashley Six uh, and Von Vertigo, I think, are, are uh, behind that one. And uh, uh, I've done a lot of stuff. Uh, I've actually got to sit in with the uh, commentators at uh, Smash Wrestling before for one of their tapings. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, the Smash guys have been really great. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there's there's the Greek Town Wrestling guys. I actually haven't seen the shows, but I, I'm all, I know all the guys on the shows from the other shows. Uh, and Destiny Pro Wrestling out in Mississauga, which was Santino's oh, uh, yeah. promotion. Battle Pro or something? Battle, Battle Arts, yeah. yeah. Uh, Pro Academy or something like that. Or Battle Pro Arts Academy. One of the two. Uh. <laughs> it's super weird to me in a way that when we trace the lineage of Canadian wrestling, the first one that they always go to is Stampede in Calgary, which, you know, I'm dialing from Long Island, New York. The Bret Hart's parents met here in this town, Long Beach. So they're not fully Canadian, but we'll let that one slide. There's that. <laughs> and then number two is we get the Montreal one where, where like Dino Bravo and Rick Martel came from, but they never yeah. really go into Ontario and Toronto yet all those legendary WWF shows happened at uh, the Maple Leaf Gardens. Yeah, Maple Leaf Wrestling. Uh, and for years, they did WWE TVs at uh, Toronto, too. Um, yeah, no, uh, Toronto, uh, the, the Tunnies, of course. Famously, president of the WWE, <laughs> Jack Tunney, uh, started his uh, allegiance with the WWE when Vince bought out the Tunnies and the Maple Leaf Wrestling promotion in Toronto. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, it was running events for years. It was uh, a place where um, Bruno San Martino spent a lot of time in Toronto, uh, pretty much when, when he wasn't working with um, the McMahons in New York. He was up uh, working for the Tunnies in Toronto and did a lot of business up I here. I know that. Wow. 
Wow. Yeah. Kind of he even kinda... he even covered it a bit on the WWE documentary. But he'll, he, if you pay attention, he talks about uh, going up to Toronto whenever uh, you know, and and that was always one of the the deals he kept with the McMahons is he uh, the Tunnies had been good for him, so he had uh, paid them back in Toronto. Uh, Sweet Daddy Siki still lives in Toronto, yeah. and uh, spent a lot of time uh, working for Maple Leaf Wrestling and filling up seats at uh, Maple Leaf Gardens. Uh, yeah, he's still, I mean, not so much now, but uh, he, he's been running karaoke out in the east end of the city for years. And he, tra uh, and he trained Edge and Christian, Sweet Daddy Siki? Uh, I, I know uh, Edge, uh, I, I think he had a hand in the Ron Hutchison school where those guys uh, went to. Also, um, uh, Sin Kazarni uh, oh, yeah. was, was part of that group of guys. Kazarni. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yeah, had a long, long history of, uh, of great wrestling in, in Toronto. I mean, Whipper Billy Watson, uh, to name a few legendary Canadians, uh, master yeah. of the mule style man kick. <laughs> <laughs> that is the best phrase I've heard all day. The mule style man pit. That could be a future comedy album if I may say so, but, uh, going through the nerdy path that I am, I've looked and found that a lot of comedians have either written for WWF or WWE, or at least tried to. I remember reading Patrice O'Neill did, Matt McCarthy did. Did you ever submit just for kicks an application to write for them? I never did. Uh, I sort of uh, was far too focused on succeeding at stand-up to think that that would be uh, a place to go with it. Um, I did go to wrestling school for a hot minute when I was 30, but uh, uh, it was like I, I had comedy was just starting to do really well. And it was like, I can't miss comedy gigs to practice wrestling. <laughs> but if I, if I don't practice wrestling all the time, then my body resets on me when yeah. I come back from touring. And uh, it just became this like, I, I'd show up when I could show up, but that's not something you can do in wrestling school. Right, you either have to be able to commit to it. Uh, and, and really the big fear was dropping someone else. Like, you know, I, I was quite willing to put myself through the ringer, but the, the fear of, of not being, not being prepared and, and uh, dropping someone on their head or landing on someone's head uh, got to be too much for me. And I just decided to pick the dream that was paying off right now. So I, I, I went I went with the comedy 100%. And it worked out all right, I'm going to say, you know. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely did. Do you find, though, that a lot of people watch Leonard Kenny have no idea that you're a stand-up? Uh, you know, there's a mixed bag. There's, there's the people that knew uh, what I did before, you know, like uh, it's one of those things. I've, I've been doing this since uh, 2000. Uh, well, I mean, actually, I've been, I've been in acting since I was 14. So, but I've been in stand-up uh, since 2000, and uh, so you know, I you work years to become an overnight success. So, <laughs> there's yeah. some people who are still surprised to this day to find out that Squirrely Dan does stand-up, and uh, a lot of people think it's going to be like when Squirrely Dan did stand-up on the show. They they expect me to have the voice, and you know, did you ever notice and uh, <laughs> all that, but. Then they show up and it's like, oh, I, I talk like this and I don't uh, add plurals where they're not supposed to be. And uh, the right. malapropisms are really just a tool of the character on the show. Uh, but it, some people knew before. I mean, uh, I, I'd been on roast battles in the States before Letterkenny hit the airways there. So some people knew me from that, uh, you know, uh, just for laughs and, and uh, other such tapings that had uh, put my face out there in the past. So some people knew I was a stand-up beforehand. Some people are just finding it out, and uh, some people learned pretty quick when they Googled the show. So <laughs> I, I have to imagine it, that your situation is kind of like Patton Oswalt's when he was on King of Queens playing kind of like a dumb, ignorant character, and then what he's saying in his stand-up has very little to do with that character. And... 
a lot of people just like, I, I enjoy King of Queens and they go to see him and then they're horrified <laughs> by what they see. And in your case, you had that earlier thing where people were using you for memes, which is a sign that you're a big star when you become the meme person. And the memes have nothing to do with who you are, clearly. Yeah, uh, I mean, they have nothing to do with the show, clearly, which was the other weird part is that it was obviously made by someone who wasn't familiar with the characters because uh, uh, Squirrely Dan is by far the most progressive character I've ever been yeah. asked to play. And uh, Professor <laughs> Trisha, yeah. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's actually kind of fun because over the years, Dan has evolved to this uh, very progressive, you know, uh, pro-feminist, pro-LGBTQ, um, you know, woke farmer, if you will. <laughs> and uh, so it's, it's added this, uh, this extra element to the character where, uh, you know, like small town people get it and small town people love it, but big city people get it and big city people love it. And uh, we've got this, you know, great mix of, uh, you know, like it, it, when I do shows now, there's this mix of audience of like guys in mesh back trucker hats who look like Squirrely Dan at the show, but also there's a whole bunch of people from a woman's studies class who've also come <laughs> to check out the show because it's uh, it's the only show that has a 300 pound bearded feminist on it. <laughs> uh, speaking of 300 pound bearded feminists, uh, AEW Tonight on its Dark Show has a tag team debuting that I think you're gonna look at them and you're gonna go, that would have been me as a wrestler. It's a, it's a tag team called Bear Country. Have you ever heard of them? No, but it sounds great. I think you're going to like them. They're from here in Long Island. They, they were trained by the same people as MJF and Max Caster and Chris Statlander. Okay. Right on. Right on. Oh, good guys, so good company. <laughs> and we've talked about wrestling. We've talked about your stand-up career, and I see some great comic book stuff behind you that looks kind of vintage. Oh, yeah, no, my, uh, my fiancé got me these as our housewarming, some classic uh, cover reprints, first appearance of Wolverine, first yeah. Captain America punching out Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta love uh, just like Bugs Bunny blowing up Emperor Hirohito. It's in that same kind of uh, family. <laughs> but uh, I now know the comics are maybe a number three, number four, but I do remember a lot of Sammy Hagar references in Letter Kenny. Did you have anything to do with those? No, uh, I'm trying to remember where the the Sammy Hagar stuff came from. Uh, I mean, I, look, I I, uh, I I love my classic rock uh, as much as the next guy, um, and I wish I had some Sammy Hagar stories, uh, but uh, but no, uh, uh, that was that was an excellent writing team. I mean, our, our writing team is is top notch. Uh, I mean, Jacob and, and Jared do a lot of the, the writing themselves, uh, but also we have uh, Trevor Risk and uh, Jonathan Torrens mm -hmm. uh, from the Trailer Park Boys and of course, uh, Mr. Dick on our show. And uh, uh, Anna Hopkins uh, writes for us, uh, some terrific writers. So uh, I'd be hard pressed to pick out exactly who was the uh, Van Halen fanatic in that one but uh I, i'm always pleasantly surprised by the crazy stuff that they come up with and uh <laughs> where i was going with that is i was trying to find out if you had to bite your lip because you knew that david lee roth is the better singer of van halen you know i i uh it, it, the classic van halen is david lee roth but people sleep on how good hagar was you know he, he may not have been David Lee Roth, but uh, Sammy Hagar was no slouch either. <laughs> Agreed. It's a different band. It's, it's like ACDC. You can like Bon Scott and Brian Johnson because there were different bands with different sounds. So we're yeah. going to agree on that one. You know, uh, after a while, it really didn't matter who was fronting ACDC. You were good. If you saw them in concert, you were only going to see the one guy, no matter how much you wanted the other one so <laughs> well said so focusing in on your career like everybody you know you're basically locked down and not doing everything that you want to do and i know that there's a new season of letter kenny about to come out but what's going on otherwise what should you be promoting and we should be checking out 
Uh, we, we do have uh, another season of Letter Kenny coming out uh, December 25th on Crave, December 26th on Hulu. And uh, we filmed that uh, last year, so the pre-pandemic. Uh, filmed that last, uh, last fall. Uh, so it's another winter season. Uh, and we, we are still under contract to deliver or me two more seasons. Um, we were supposed to go back to work this past summer, but uh, pandemic got in the way. Um, but we should be going back to work in the spring, uh, knock on wood. Yeah. Uh, everything seems to be headed in that direction, and uh, productions have been happening in this country, and, and uh, they've had very, very few cases of outbreak uh, on any production so it's looking very Great. optimistic that uh, that we'll be back to work and uh, I mean this is something that uh, you know uh, I know that Kiso has, has often said to me he'd be quite happy doing Letter Kenny for the rest of his career uh, so uh, we have no intention of stopping anytime soon but eventually it won't be up to us but uh, <laughs> as long as uh, right. As long as as long as people want to see it, we want to keep making it, and uh, so, but we definitely do have at least two more seasons to deliver after the one that comes out on Christmas. So there'll be those to look forward to. Um, yeah, I've got a couple other things in the works. Uh, nothing that I can go too into detail on, but uh, some some projects I'm hoping to get into development, and some projects that are in development that uh, hopefully will be announced soon, fingers yeah. crossed. And uh, yeah, I also, it's the Christmas season. So I have a, a Christmas comedy record people can go pick up that I released last year, uh, Christmas with a K, uh, <laughs> available wherever music is uh, downloaded. And you can also buy a uh, vinyl edition from ktrevorwilson.com and uh, uh, comedyrecords.ca. And uh, I got a t-shirt store now. Uh, speaking of pro wrestling with uh, uh, Beyond the Collar, uh, who are the guys behind Pro Wrestling Tees. Uh, my buddy Ron Funches had been working with them for years. and oh, We talked about wrestling fan comedians. Ron Funches is one of them. Oh, yeah. No, Ron and I uh, met a few years ago at the JFL and immediately bonded over our shared loves of uh, comedy and wrestling and pot. So... Uh, uh, <laughs> Ron has been a great buddy. I actually, uh, the first time my fiance saw me, I was opening for Ron in Toronto. So he's directly responsible for me knowing uh, my, my future wife. Uh, so, uh, uh, but Funch has got, got me in with uh, Beyond the Collar people. So now I have a, a t-shirt store on there. Okay, Trevor Wilson, uh, uh, just look it up, t-shirts, it'll come up on Google. You can put it in the Google <laughs> machine as much as I like to say. Well, two quick questions and then you're a free man. And the first one is, Judah Friedlander uh, sort of notoriously taught Mick Foley how to do stand-up. Have you been put into a position yet where you had a wrestler asking you how to do stand-up? Um, I've, I've known a couple guys to give it a try. I uh, didn't really seek too much advice, but I've been at uh, wrestling shows and had uh, uh, the the promoter go, you know, send the wrestlers to talk to me about, uh, well, th this guy knows how to talk. He'll tell you how to, and I, I've <laughs> had to give some advice to wrestlers and it's like, okay, well, I don't know if you can apply this to what you're going to do, but this is what I do, <laughs> you know. So I've, I've given uh, stand-up advice to a couple uh, wrestlers, but in the context of them, needing the, the stand-up advice for wrestling advice. <laughs> Point taken. And the closer for you, any last words for the kids? Uh, wear a mask. Fair. <laughs> Simple, but effective and true. Well, I can't thank you enough for your time. Looking forward to seeing what you think of Bear Country on AEW Dark. But I just keep up all the greatness and hope to see you live in New York when this all blows over. Oh, thanks so much. I hope to be working again when this is all done. <laughs> thanks, Kate <Hey>, Trev. <laughs> Take care, man. Cheers. Thanks so much, bud. Have a good one. You too. Outrocast.